Welcome back to Left Anchor. I'm Alexi the Greek. And I'm Ryan Cooper. Coming back to you with uh, the belated part two of our uh, Martin Hagland um, series. Uh, you, you may remember, loyal loyal listeners may remember, it's been a couple of months now. Time means nothing <laughs> to me under quarantine. <laughs> All the days slide uh, into one another and... Um, each day is simultaneously 10,000 years long and passes in the blink of an eye. Um, and so, so true. back uh, circa 2500 BC, we did a first episode of Martin <laughs> Hagland. And uh, now we're, we're, we're following up their promise, part two. And we're, we're going to be talking, you know, just about the, the book in general, uh, This Life, um, which is, you know, about his vision of democratic socialism and uh, you know, his sort of philosophy of, uh, you know, kind of the good life and, and whatnot. And, uh, also a collection, a sort of symposium that the, uh, Los Angeles review of books did, uh, soliciting comment from a number of writers, philosophers, and so on. Um, Ben Kunkel was in there, uh, a number of other people. And, uh, yeah, so we'll link to the kind of the, 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 uh, list of those of those pieces in case you're curious uh, because there's yeah a bunch of responses to the book and then hogland also has some responses to the responses um and uh yeah we'll be talking about a few of those as well so democratic socialism is it good or bad um <laughs> i like it let's let's have it let's do it <laughs> Yeah, and, and Hogland has a very, you know, he calls it a novel concept of democratic socialism. And uh, I think in other contexts, people have called it just like communism. Uh, and so we, we can review a little bit. If, by the way, if you haven't listened to part one of our discussion, and you're obviously you're a patron, if you can listen to this, you should probably go back and listen to that. I think you'd enjoy it. And it would yeah. set up this conversation uh, if you really want. well. If you want. You know, you're free. This is, you know, we're socialists. It's all about freedom of choice. And, and you know, really, how do you want to commit yourself and identify uh, who you are as a person? Do you feel, anyway, I'm getting into the actual Hoglandian <laughs> kind of approach to uh, existentialist socialist uh, meaning making. But uh, yeah, yeah so, so, so maybe I, I can recap a few main things that Hogland is setting forth as crucial to his understanding of democratic socialism. And then we could maybe get into some of these critiques and his responses and, and, and kind of these, these contested areas, both theoretically and practically. Does that sound good? Perfect. Cool. So, uh, really, he, he, in his massive tome, which it's not quite Piketty level, it's, it's like what, uh, I don't know, 600 pages, something like that. He has it in yeah. two parts, as you, as you might remember. And, the first part is the kind of existentialist part, uh, the ontological metaphysical examination that leads to kind of the political um, setup in the second part, which is to say who we are as human beings and, and what makes meaning for us should then lead us to uh, the proper political considerations for how to lead a fulfilling life based on that analysis, right? So so he thinks of of the human as not just naturally free, but spiritually free, right? And so, so freedom is key and a certain understanding of freedom, which is not just the freedom to choose, because in a certain sense, there's a freedom to choose um, that's not just human, but, but to the freedom to take as a question what we ought to choose, right? The normative question is, is particularly human. And, uh, you know, if science discovers that other animals can, can do this, then Hoglund doesn't care. He's just saying that spiritual freedom itself is, is being able to decide, uh, how you ought to live, right? And, and there, there of course are historical, cultural, you know, um, societal, norms that that situate things and constrain things but the ability to say well this is what society wants me to do and this is what society says is meaningful is that right is it as an individual existentialist and then collective existentialist question because um his notion of of spiritual freedom is one that is connected to understanding the human as necessarily social right? Necessarily embedded in relationships. And so that's why freedom is coupled with democracy and the need to politically and eventually allow for our ability to 
to answer that question of how we ought to live, how we ought to, to make meaning out of our finite lives as a social collective question. And this is where the critique of capitalism comes in, right? Because yeah. he basically says that the mode of production under capitalism explicitly designs things so that you are not really able, you're not truly free to answer that question and live the life based on your answer to that question individually and collectively. Would you, would you say that's a, a fair start? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, you, you have a sort of stunted you know, uh, horizons and imagination and, and moral lives and, uh, under, under capitalism and people end up kind of forced into doing things that they, that they wouldn't want to do and, and, uh, are unable to sort of consider, you know, even the question of what they would, uh, want to do. And, um, yeah, I thought that, you know, in the, in the first of his responses to, to his critiques, um, I thought he had a, a good illustration of the uh, the question of, um, you know, free time and, you know, sort of right. different varieties of free time. So 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 Kunkel and others, uh, you know, bring up the, the phenomenon of the idle rich, you know, the the sort of Bertie Wooster types who are just a com- complete mm-hmm. like like dullards or even kind of sociopaths who are just just in in engaged in a sort of orgy of wretched excess um, and just consumption for its own sake and, you know, addiction to drugs and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, he sort of contrasts that with what you, you know, you might, uh, so what he calls it socially, socially available free time. And the, the point he makes there, which, which I think is a good one is that, you know, as a socially available free time, you are not, you, you do not escape, you know, the sort of like web of, uh, mutual obligation, you know, on the contrary, right. you, you can't have a decent, you know, uh, you know, quantity of socially available free time without recognizing your mutual interdependence, you know? And so that free time, which is, you know, time outside of the sort of, you know, traditional system of production, um, could involve things that were formerly a part of that, uh, you know, um, maintaining your, your lawn or, you know, the daily activities that you maybe would have paid someone to do before, you know, or, right. or, or had been forced to do to just to make wages yourself. Um, and so, you know, the, there, it follows that the, you know, the reason that the, the idle rich phenomenon is so terrible is that, you know, those, those people are, they are not engaged in any sort of mutual relationship. They are, yes. they are about extracting, you know, labor from, from others and even tens of thousands of people, you know, it's a, if you're super rich, you know, the, the ability to be, to be idle relies on you being able to command resources and labor from, you know, like right, people right. all over the planet and to, to be able to live, you know, with people waiting on you hand and foot because you have, you know, the money to command those, those things to happen. And the fundamental emptiness of that, like just being totally divorced from any kind of like human, you know, interaction is probably, I mean, I think he suggests fairly convincingly that that's why those, uh, people, the, the, the idle rich tend to, uh, end up as sort of, you know, drug addicts and, and so on. It just, a not a, it, it, it's just a sort of, uh, a, a lower order, you might say a, a lower species of, um, you know, pleasure seeking, which is just yeah. you just they're, sort they're of all, animal. They're all uh, basically they're all basically Charlie Sheen, and they think they're hashtag winning, but actually they're miserable fucks. Yeah, yeah, definitely in a in a lot of senses. And what you know, um, it, the one quibble I would have with this this notion of the the free time and the you know I think it's correct that 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 should sort of be like the political objective, like expanding the space of socially available free time for everyone. Uh, I, I think he's a little, you know, he, he has a little sort of austere vision of free time, you know, because like all his examples involves like, you know, the, you're still working, you know, like he's a little hard on goofing off, you know, <laughs> and I think that, you know, if 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 you if 
you have it set up, you know, your system, you have such abundance and it's so uh, uh, shared that, you know, insofar as like you're on vacation and there are people who are like serving you drinks or whatever, uh, they're not doing it because they're f afraid of poverty or, you know, they just, it's like a thing for them to do. Um, and uh, I think that's fine. You know, you, you ought to be able to just fuck around and not really do anything like, like as long as that fucking around is not, you know, contingent on other people being exploited mercilessly, then yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. live the office space I, dream, do nothing. I, it's, it's fine. And I'm not even, <laughs> I, I agree with you hundred percent. I, and I'm not even sure if he's against goofing off. He's specifically like arguing against a critique yeah, that yeah, sure, he's sure. that right. So it's possible. So what I so if I'm trying to be, uh, like what I think maybe Hogland is, is saying, uh, I would say that goofing off is good or bad, depending if it's part of like a democratically understood good life that we all deserve. And so it's not because it's not this atomistic thing. Like I get to goof off and I don't care if no one else does. It's like, we all deserve, you know, and, and if we get to the David Harvey, uh, kind of suggestions, ideas for political praxis, one of his ideas was to slow things down, to have more le leisure time and all that. Um, but he's specifically responding to this crit critique that says, well, the idle rich have lots of leisure time and some of them choose to use heroin. Some, you know, is that all great? And, and he's saying, well, first of all, it's not about leisure time as we currently understand it under capitalism, because that's like an atomistic alienated form that is unfree, even for the capitalists, even for the masters, the masters and the slaves are both unfree, right? Because neither are really, um, involved in this individual and collective like co-determination of how we should live. And we agree. And I think that like most people in this kind of participatory democracy that he's envisioning would, would agree. Leisure time goofing off is awesome. Like do it, go for it. That's great. Right. Yeah. And, and that's of course contingent on like the fact that we've developed in society to a place where our technology and our resources and such, uh, if we make an egalitarian society wouldn't force everyone to, to kind of work 90 hours a week. Like that's not what's required socially. Right. Um, and, and, and that's the reason like it would be different though, if um, circumstances change and you want to go goof off, but now there's, I don't know. I don't know if pandemic's a good example because that means we should work less in a way, but like if circumstances require socially that you don't, goof off as much that really is is the consideration um and so i don't think he's against goofing off as much as the question you ask yourself what does a good life look like it can include goofing off but the key is that you don't think of yourself as kind of atomistic you should think of yourself as interconnected is that i mean i don't know if that responds to your critique yeah yeah i, I think you could develop a sort of hag haglundian you know, because he's just like a very philosopher -y, you know, type of... Yeah. He doesn't like to talk about, you know, uh, 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 drinking Details. mimosas on the beach so much. But <laughs> you could imagine that, you know, it's like insofar as like you're getting your mimosas from someone who, who views the providing of mimosas as an important yes, social exactly. duty to be yes. done for its own sake. Because, you know, it's very enjoyable to sort of participate in other people's pleasure and like... You know, like Ryan, I would love that. I would love to be the mimosa guy. I would <laughs> yeah. love to serve people. Like you know me, right? Like I yeah. would dig that. That there that is, is literally like, yeah. There are people. That's the key, though. Like they live to be like a major <laughs> d. You know, just, just a, yeah. like like a you know operate a restaurant or something they love. There's a, a Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Cisco's father. You know, in like the the post uh, post scarcity space communism. Uh, he does uh, old fashioned Creole food in uh, um, New Orleans and he does it like there's no money in Star Trek at this point and it's just for fun. Right. He just likes doing yeah. it. And so people come and they see what's on the menu and they enjoy, you know, the food and talking to him and so on. And so it's just all about the pleasure of the experience and the pleasure of, of uh, you know, cooking and giving pleasure to others and and it's yes. all and yes. nobody is getting sort of ripped off, you know. It's, no, that's right. Here's because because here's what he wants to avoid. As long as the motivation, the structures of motivation are such that the people serving the mimosas are the ones that are like 
connected to that. They're not alienated from the activity. They're not alienated from the people that are benefiting from the activity. Instead of like, you could, you could see a slightly different thing where like, you know what? I one day could own my own business serving mimosas, but first I have to spend a few years doing like shit work I don't like. And, and, and like the more that your society is based on people most of the time doing the shit work that they're alienated from that they don't like in order to save up capital so that they can then do something, you know, like that's, yeah. that's the problem of, of being too distant. He wants to just like directly, what are you doing with your time and your skills and so forth? That should be a choice you make, not because of coercion or not because you want to acquire capital, you know, people are ends in themselves and like what you do with your creative energy should be that, that, that thing you find important because who you are is being fulfilled in that, right? You love people. So, so do something, you know what I mean? And so he's, he's trying to envision something where like the decisions aren't centered around profit making. They're centered around who you are and who you want to be in that context of relationships and that web of relationships. That's the end of the preview, folks. If you want to hear the whole episode, you can go to patreon.com slash left anchor. Thanks for listening.